the ship. I'd go back as far as the um, the first Mellesworth Theory at Work conference, that sort of time. Um, okay. Because that seemed, seemed to me that leadership started soon after that, let's say, around about the 2000s, soon after 2000. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So would, would you say a bit about the, the learning company and those ideas that existed really at the, at the start of those conferences at the beginning from what I can remember? Right. Um, well, the learning company, uh, 1990, uh, was said over lunch, uh, that was the year that the... Um, Sangley's fifth discipline uh, came out, uh, and our learning company one, I think, came out in '91. But we published stuff then back in '89, and obviously, for us and presumably Peter Sangley, there was five or more years before that when we um, were researching it and the like. Um, and the learning company, or learning organisation, kicked in as, as I said over lunch. Um, Mark Easterby Smith and various others make a distinction between learning company, which is the more applied design science uh, norms of you know, what to do to become a, a learning organisation and the advantages of it. And organisational learning is the more analytical science, uh, which on this occasion kicked off probably mid, mid-1990s. And sort of gave way probably with four or five years later a bit to knowledge management which I'm sure you've heard of um, and uh, they hadn't been going long on that theme when they discovered that they needed to understand knowing so knowing as a process creates knowledge and knowing in that sense is another word for learning and a bit, a bit later still following that stream and tradition uh, the term dynamic capability came into being, uh, which is again learning organisation by another name, uh, probably not using the old word, which may, may have its advantages. I remember um, in the early days of learning company talking to the personnel director of Boots, the chemist chain, and he said, well, we think of ourselves as a learning company, learning organisation, and use it, but we don't come out in public because my managing director and I agree that the stock exchange will think we've gone soft. Um, oh. <coughs> which I think is quite interesting. Um, so anyway, probably um, late 90s, early uh, 2000s, dynamic capability uh, became of interest. Um, and that has a slightly different um, theoretical and um, practical base. It um, relates largely to economics and resource-based fuel the firm. And um, takes the line that there are kind of the, there are primary value chains, which create uh, goods and services, and add value to something and generate the profits. Uh, and then there are second order value chains that develop and change, and enhance and innovate the primary value chains. The most obvious example would be research and development, which has been you know obviously around for forever. Um, <coughs> and um, just about any other um, <clears throat> business function, if you like, that has a primary value chain, potentially also has R&D applied to it. R&D, I guess, usually applies to production, goods and services, mm-hmm. develop your accounting system, your marketing systems, presumably your personnel systems, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think... Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure we're I in mean, leadership, the interest in leadership, I think, followed on largely from the virtualization of organizations um, and knowledge work and knowledge managers. Um, there are three tests, uh, in my view, of a, of a virtual organization. Firstly, the people in it spend a large proportion of their time in front of a screen of one kind or another. Um, and work independently. They can telework, work at home, work in the office, work on a train, work in Starbucks, because uh, it doesn't matter where they are. Um, the second one is a large amount of the transactions uh, and databases are used and accessed virtually. So um, 
so again, you can work all over the world. In, in the old days, I worked with the SO Research Laboratory in Abingdon, this is probably in the 70s, and then they would relocate uh, researchers and their families and so on from all over around the world to Abingdon. If that's where they decided to locate a particular project, they would move them, hire them houses, pay their golf club fees, put their kids into private schools. It was an expensive operation. Whereas these days, um, uh, the researchers stay put. My Exxon then had research labs in Linden, New Jersey, Abingdon, and somewhere in Germany. Um, but these days, they would, they would stay put. They would work virtually, um, fly together for a meeting, 